Uh, I also wanted to show that it's necessary and possible uh, for us to come together uh, when we have disagreements, however severe, uh, and bring our arguments to the table uh, outside of the uh, political influence and interests of state actors and mainstream narratives. Um, so I thought we're in a university, let's get people together in a room, um, start from the beginning, uh, and uh, yeah, and work through this in pursuit of truth and a resolution to, to human suffering. In 70 AD, the Romans retake Jerusalem from the Jews and destroy their second temple. Uh, that's very significant because that remains a very holy spot for the Jews right now. Then fast forward to 636, the Muslims conquer Palestine, which gradually becomes an Arab-speaking uh, population. Now, fast forward to 1091 to 1291, the Crusaders occupy much of Palestine. Then in 1291, the Egyptian Mamluks uh, take over Palestine, defeating both the Mongols and the Crusaders. And then uh, the reason 1492 is important is because uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese expel Iberian Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, causing the Ottoman Empire to have the largest Jewish population in the world. And so now, as you guys know, uh, Ottoman Empire has the largest Jewish population in the world, and 1517 and the Ottomans have control of Palestine. Well, there are two, I think, ways that people conceive of this conflict that are basically wrong. One is that there is a kind of state called Palestine. There's a country, Palestine. Palestine's fighting Israel. And why is Palestine always fighting Israel? Like Russia and Ukraine, for example. That is not the case. So there are the Palestinians. There is no sovereign Palestinian state because the state or the society that occupied Palestine, which I'll speak about until 1948, was destroyed in 1948 to make way for the state of Israel expelling the Palestinians into where they now live, leaving about half of them, the rest of them ending up in places like Gaza. That's why Gaza has two million people in it. They lived in what is now Israel. They are the indigenous inhabitants of that place. So that's the first point. The second point, which is very commonly assumed or is very current in kind of political responses to the present crisis, is to see this in some way as a conflict between two global religious entities, Muslims and Jews, and that therefore something that you say about this conflict or this situation is in some way either an attack on Muslims or Jewish communities in this country, that somehow the Palestinians and Israel are representatives of two religious traditions that have always been in conflict and that this is an age-old um, kind of war. That is untrue. It is not age old, it's about 100 years old, and it is not religious. It's not about religious uh, ideas. It's about the settlement of this particular land, Palestine, by a movement of people from Europe who were Jews, but not representative necessarily of the majority of the Jewish population in the world at that time. So those are two things to bear in mind. So to come on to where we are here, under the Ottoman Empire, there wasn't a particular area called Palestine. So it's part of other administrative units connected either to Beirut or Damascus in the north, a separate, um, a separate uh, area around Jerusalem in the middle, and then more to do with the Hejaz, so the Arabian northern part of the Arabian Peninsula in the south. There's no separate unit that we would call Palestine. Although the term was used in a loose sense but people often also refer to this area as Syria. And the inhabitants of the area would probably just have referred to it as Bilad Asham, or the, what we call the Levant, so that part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Under the Ottomans, it was a fairly kind of tolerant society in a sense. So not in our sense, not the way that we think everybody has individual equal rights to freedom of religion and so on. But different religious communities basically ran their own affairs with a kind of ruling Sunni Muslim elite. So they were un undoubtedly in charge, but basically most of the society ran fairly autonomously. And that included in this area, 
greater Syria, let's say, yes, communities of Muslims, but also very large communities of Christians and um, a fair number of Jews. So there were Jewish communities in this area. The idea that we'll perhaps hear about from John, that this was a land without people, so uninhabited, is completely untrue. Not only was it not a land without people, it wasn't even a land without Jewish people. It had an indigenous Jewish community in it, um, who were not generally subject to the kind of Judeophobia and anti-Semitism that happened in Christian Europe. So in the Islamic empires generally, and the Ottoman Empire particularly, there were outbursts of kind of attacks on religious minorities, Christians, Jews, Shia, non-Sunni Muslims. It happened from time to time. But this whole ideology of there being some kind of race of people who are need to be controlled or exterminated or some particular threat. It's not present even in the most kind of, uh, let's say, most conservative forms of Islamic and Arab discourse in the 19th century. There was a particular incident in Damascus which came to attract, it's important, because it came to attract the interest of Christians in Europe, particularly in this country and in Scotland, um, about it, and a, a blood libel, so the kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory against the Jews that they are using the blood of Christian children for ritual purposes, which is a completely European thing, does not appear in the Middle East until this point. And it was actually fostered by um, Italian Catholic priests amongst the Christians of Damascus in order to offer a kind of a strategic entry point. But that led to a discussion about what do we do about the Jews of the Middle East in this country, and therefore in general, about the idea of what they called restoring the Jews to uh, the Holy Land, which is the origin really of the idea of Zionism, was the Ottomans entered the First World War on the side of the central powers, so the Germans, and they lost. Britain, which didn't really care that much about this area, but wanted, of course, to defeat a, a German ally, took Palestine, or took, it defeated the Ottomans in 1917, coming up from Egypt through Gaza to Jerusalem. From that point on, um, it was under military rule of the British in the first instance, and then it came to be under mandate rule, which we'll go on to the next part. But the important thing is, Britain knew this was going to happen. They could get that uh, the Ottoman Empire was going to collapse in this area. And so started making plans for um, the future. But they were completely different and contradictory plans for different people. So the first one is uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. So you might have heard of this. This was an agreement between the British and French foreign ministers in 1916. We know about it because after the Russian Revolution, it was, it was secret. It was made open. It was uh, people, allowed people to see it. People often say this established the borders of the states in the Middle East. It didn't. That is not true. But what it did do was establish the idea that Britain and France should control zones of influence. France in Syria and Lebanon, Britain in Iraq, uh, northern Saudi Arabia, southern part of Palestine, and a kind of middle buffer zone, which would contain Jerusalem, basically. So the principle being these colonial powers, without asking anyone, didn't go and ask the Palestinians or the Syrians or the Saudis, what do you think about us controlling your country? Because they probably have said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, divided it up between the two of them, in principle, not in the actuality of the borders, but in principle. That was followed by, of course, um, or the Hussein McMahon correspondence, which was between the Sharif Hussein, so the leader or the kind of monarch of Mecca and Medina, so the, the Muslim holy places, the leader of the Arab revolt. Of, if you've seen Lawrence of Arabia, he's in that. So this kind of movement of tribes essentially to attack the Ottomans in the rear. As a reward or an encouragement for that, McMahon, who was the ruler of Egypt at the time, basically, 
or the British High Commissioner in Egypt, um, essentially promised this dynasty, so not people, but this monarch and his family, control of an Arab kingdom that would run from essentially the Sinai Peninsula to possibly the Gulf, ill-defined area, with some exceptions, it says in the text, west of Aleppo, whatever that means. Um, so a kind of hazy promise. And then the final one, which is very well known, I think John will maybe speak a bit about the man who came up with it, um, the Balfour Declaration. So the Balfour Declaration, and I shall look at the text because it's quite important, was made by the Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur Balfour, who incidentally was from Edinburgh, or from Haddington, and he was also the Chancellor of Edinburgh University for um, decades. The Balfour Declaration stated, His Majesty's Government shall look with favour upon the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. Notice that they're not considered to have a national home. They are reduced to the states of communities. In Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I mean, why would they do this? It was a war. So this is the First World War is the context for this. As a strategic move, Britain or British policymakers thought that having this kind of colony essentially in the Middle East would make a, a statelet that would always be dependent on Britain. And this was expressed by Sir Ronald Storrs, who was the first governor of Jerusalem, so he was not a marginal figure, when he described the planned settlement as a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabs. Winston Churchill, 1920, at the time of the San Remo negotiations stated, a Jewish state under the protection of the crown would from every point of view be beneficial and would be especially in harmony with the truest interests of the British Empire. Um, Chaim Weizmann, so the first president of Israel, leading, really leading Zionist figure, states in his uh, memoirs, what we wanted was a protectorate. A Jewish Palestine would be a safeguard to England, in particular in respect to the Suez Canal. So it's important to understand that this is not being done out of some kind of notion of the welfare of the Jewish people. Balfour was quite anti-Semitic in that he had pushed forward legislation designed to stop Jewish immigration to Britain in 1905. So you, you mentioned at the beginning that you consider the uh, Palestinians to be the indigenous population to this land. Um, how do you define indigenous? They were living there. They're living there, it's obvious. The Palestinians were simply the people who were living in Palestine when it was colonized. That's all we need to know. John, do you share that same opinion? Um, I, I agree with every word there. What I don't know is whether there are any academic definitions of the word indigenous. Um, it's not something I've looked into, but I think in terms of, you know, that is, that is straightforward. The Jews who were indigenous to Palestine, and um, Jamie didn't say anything about this, and I don't know if you agree, but I suspect you do. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that there has always there have always been Jews living in Palestine. You know, this is the whatever happened in 78 AD did not get rid of the entire Jewish community there. Uh, there were Jews there. There was another revolt a hundred in AD 130. We know. And there's much evidence to show this, you know, archaeological evidence of synagogues and so on. But were they a separate people from the other people inhabiting Palestine, apart from the settlers who'd come to Europe, from Europe, who I'm going to be talking about in a minute, they were Arabic speaking, they were Arab in culture. If I could just come back to a, a previous point that you made, because you had said that that might confuse some people. You had said that there were some Jews that were indigenous to the, the land, but then also that uh, Palestinians were the indigenous people to that land. That may confuse a, a few people in the audience. Okay. That's only a problem if you think that there's a contradiction between being a Jew and being Palestinian, and there isn't. Sure. Um, so in fact, 
the other thing to remember is this category of national identity, which we're conflating with religious identity here, and we shouldn't, is recent. It didn't really exist at this time, and it didn't exist for Jews or Muslims, Christians, anyone. So there were lots of religious communities speaking the same language, basically, in this area, as there were across the Middle East. But there was no notion of a, a nationality that they could have. You mentioned the Hussein McMahon correspondence, and you implied it wasn't clear. Um, there is a very good book that only came out this year by a man called Peter Shambrook, mm -hmm. called Policy of Deceit. And he has gone into the He's actually spent a life's work dissecting the Sykes-Picot correspondence and how it was interpreted. And I think his book, which is published by One World Academic, shows pretty conclusively, I think it's now very hard to argue that Britain did not promise Palestine would be included in the Arab state. The book? Oh, Policy of Deceit. Policy of Deceit. Zionism, as a word, appeared in the 1880s, Zionismus in German, where it began. And basically what Zionism is, it is a form of Jewish nationalism. It is the main form of Jewish nationalism. There are other forms, but I don't think any of them really survive today. And um, this is also part of the same thing, the same phenomenon of nationalism spreading as an idea. And of course, the 19th century was the great age of European nationalism. You had the unification of Germany and Italy in about 1870. Um, and you also had a little bit, religion was beginning to retreat as the, as the dominant um, spiritual and, and intellectual glue holding the population together. And um, secular ideas were coming along. Liberté, égalité, fraternité from the French Revolution, the ideals of the Enlightenment, and so on. And Jews, like everybody else, were exposed to this and took part in this. And in the case of Jews, what happened was Jewish emancipation was proceeding, starting with the French Revolution and so on. Um, it was uneven. There were some cases where the position of Jews was dire, like in the Russian Empire, which was where I think maybe an absolute majority of European Jews probably lived. And Jews began basically to leave the ghetto. Quite a lot of them turned their back on religion. A lot of 19th century Jews found uh, the Judaism with, with, with which they had grown up sort of, uh, they, so they saw of it a, a relic of the past. Many of them wanted to shun it. Um, some of them converted to Christianity basically because they hoped it would make them more um, assimilated. At the same time, you had new scientific ideas coming along, some of them very dangerous things that we now see as clearly repellent. I'm talking about some of the 19th century ideas of race and racism, um, these theories of the Count of Gob de Gobineau and so on. And um, this could give a, an extra way of turning Jews into the other. In medieval Christian Europe, they had been the other on relig for religious reasons. But now, as a lot of countries began to think of them, their people as a race, um, the question was, where do minorities fit into this? Most Jews ultimately came from somewhere else. Um, it might have been from Sephardic Spain before 1492, but mo more often than not, in the overwhelming majority of cases, it was from Eastern Europe from the, what was then the empire of the Tsars and the eastern bits of the Austro-Hungarian empire like Galicia, where Jews had their own language, a, closely related to German, but written in the Hebrew alphabet, known as Yiddish. And um, as Jews assimilated, many of them began to wonder, are we really succeeding in being regarded as equal citizens? People still 
look down on us. People still despise us. People don't really accept us as being one of us. There was a of some very nasty anti-Semitic um, politicians as democracy came along, people who could win elections. And this happened notably in Vienna. And there was a guy, I think, called von Schoenerer, who was an anti-Semitic politician. And he had a famous line. He would say to a Jew, now, don't you worry. We decide who a Jew is. Doesn't mean you, my dear friend. It's just the others. And of course, we're seeing this mutatis mutandis, if you'll excuse a Latin expression, in today's world um, of people demonizing the outsider. And Jews were very vulnerable to that in late 19th century Europe. Obviously, I can't go through everything tonight. So I'm just going to speak about a very few people. But the first one was Theodor Herzl, who was the man who founded political Zionism. And he um, thought assimilation isn't working. He was convinced of that by the election of an anti-Semitic mayor in Vienna and also perhaps by the Dreyfus case. Um, what we have to do is think of ourselves as a people, as a nation. He wasn't necessarily set on Palestine being the homeland of the Jews. But he found as soon as he went to Eastern Europe, to the land of the Tsars, where the vast majority of Jews left, lived, that they believed this was the land that belonged to the Jews. And this was a belief held by people who'd never been there, who'd only read about it, who knew it in their religious texts. And of course, when Zionism became a form of nationalism for Jewish people, they often conflated religious and nationalist things. So, for instance, one of the major Jewish festivals is the Festivals of Light, Light Hanukkah, which is to celebrate the reconsecration of the temple in Jerusalem. And an eminent Zionist said, uh, a man known as Asher Ginsberg, also known as Ahad Ha'am, he said, well, really, this should be thought of as a national festival for Jews. It was about reconsecrating our most important national monument, the temple. And so many of these people who became Zionists had drifted away from religion. Um, Herzl, for instance, didn't have his son circumcised, and he shocked the chief rabbi of Vienna, who paid him a courtesy call one uh, December, probably asking him, isn't it about time you came along to synagogue? and found um, Herzl setting up a Christmas tree, um, which was a definite no-no in the eyes of the chief rabbi of Vienna in 1895. And the, the other big thing for the Zionists, not the Jews, was the revival of the Hebrew language as a national language for the Jews. Now, another form of a Jewish nationalism that hasn't survived called Bundism wanted to, wanted to big up Yiddish instead, because that is what most Jews spoke. But Ahad Ha'am and many others were afraid that Jews were just melting away. Ahad Ha'am gave up religion. He became an atheist, in fact, but he was outraged when his daughter married a non-Jew. And despite all the repression of Tsarist Russia and the horrible situation of Jews there, Many Jews were assimilating even there. As education began to spread, children began to speak Russian as well as Yiddish and began to abandon Yiddish sometimes and were not bothered to learn Hebrew. Another place where um, anti-Semitism was rife was Vienna. And there what was happening was there was a kind of squeezed middle. Um, Austrians... Um, ordinary people, small shopkeepers perhaps, who felt vulnerable because there was a new department store opening owned by a Jewish family, while at the same time there were refugees from the East who might be freezing to death on the streets in winter, but made their living at, by peddling. And that, of course, also undercut the corner shop. So you had the growth in an anti-Semitism, and that was a big factor 
in the growth of Zionism. And Herzl actually believed that all Jews would ultimately emigrate to Palestine to set up a state there, or they would assimilate. Now, Zionism was very much a minority thing among Jews, but it gradually grew, and particularly after the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which has already been mentioned by Jamie, but it only probably became a majority um, view of Jews after the start of the Second World War, as people realised just how appalling Hitler was. So I've told you about two types of Zionist. The Herzlian Zionist, who wanted to establish a state in Palestine. Um, Ahad Ha'am Zionism, which wanted it to be a spiritual centre. But even Ahad Ha'am believed that Palestine should acquire a majority Jewish population. And here you automatically have a problem because it was all this was predicated on the people of Palestine not having a right of self-determination themselves. I think there is no doubt that the Zionist project made war inevitable. One of the things the British mandate was meant to do was give self-determination to the Palestinian people. The Palestinians may not have wanted Britain there in the first place. They thought they could rule themselves. Thank you very much. Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations made it very clear the Palestinian people were entitled to political self-determination and independence. And there was an obligation in the Palestine mandate to to establish those representative institutions, which Britain did not fulfil. By contrast, they did in Jordan, they did in, the French did in Lebanon and Syria, and the British did in Iraq. And all those were mandated territories where there was the same obligation. But Palestine was denied this. And that again is one of the main problems that have led to where we are today. So Theodore Herschel is considered the uh, the father of political Zionism. Uh, what was the primary purpose of him uh, creating the Zionist conference, moving the uh, Zionist cause along? What was the primary purpose he was trying to fulfill? Was it solely to create a, uh, a Jewish state? Was it colonialism? Was it to alleviate the suffering of Jews in Europe? What was the primary purpose of the political Zionist project? Well, if you'd asked him, he would have said it is to alleviate, to alleviate the dreadful suffering of the Jews. That's, that is what he would definitely have said. And he believed that um, by establishing a Jewish state of some sort, um, it, it, it might well have been part of a wider federation. Personally, I think he had something... The, these are, the, We're talking pre-First World War here, when Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa were already politically independent of the British crown, but all had the the you know they they had they were all completely self governing but they all had the um the king of england or the queen of england as their monarch and they were they they, they were umbilically tied together in many ways and i think my personal view is that herzl saw something like that happening for a jewish palestine a predominantly jewish palestine uh, within a reformed Ottoman Empire, or maybe as a, something like another British dominion, or even a Germanian dominion in a similar way for Germany. Um, what Herzl did not do was address the um, issue of the fact that Palestine was not an empty land. If he wasn't so such a religious Jew, why was he so tied to a Jewish national homeland in Palestine, or did he have other ideas about other places where Jews could establish a national home? He personally would have been perfectly happy to. Within a month of his very sudden conversion to Zionism, he wrote in his diary that he thought we'd find somewhere in South America and we would be able to spirit the uh, indigenous population. I don't know if he used the word indigenous, but and it was in German anyway, um, 
you know, uh, we would spirit the, the penniless population across the border by refusing them opportunities to work and things. Um, but he soon found, after he set up his sorry, after he set up his his Zionist Congress, that the over the majority of the members came from the Pale of Settlement, the Empire of the Tsars, and they um, wanted. They said it's Palestine or nowhere, and so the so-called Uganda scheme got nowhere. But he also thought of El Arish and the Sinai Peninsula, Cyprus, um, Mesopotamia what's now Libya, um, even apparently the Congo, Mozambique, and Madagascar. And other Zionists, there was another Zionist leader a little before him called uh, Leon Penska, who some of you may have heard of, who was exactly the same. And, and, and what, was, I mean, what was his plan for establishing uh, this Jewish state? Was it just go in guns blazing and, and conquer? Or was it immigration? Or, or was it through using the British and other uh, imperial powers? I mean, how- he, he, saw it, he saw it as something to be done by diplomatic means, supported by the powers of the day. Um, it would re- require money. And the mechanism he saw for doing it was a chartered company. Now, I don't know if how many of you have studied um, European expansion or whatever you like to call it. I'm trying to try and use a neutral term. But an awful lot of European expansion across the oceans was done in a semi-privatized form of of imperialism by um, private companies, chartered companies. The most famous ones for us are probably the East India Company, And there was also the British South Africa Company set up by Cecil Rhodes, of whom Herzl was a great admirer, by the way, that basically colonized what's now Zimbabwe and Zambia and Malawi. Um, And the idea, one of the ideas in international law at the time was that companies like this could have sovereignty over land. And I think he envisaged something similar in... um, in Palestine. As we've heard, um, Zionism was developing as a nationalist movement, primarily in, in Europe. And so it meant moving people from there. Mainly, there were, there were some people who came from Yemen, small number, and Morocco, small number in this period, but basically European immigration, which could only really be achieved under this thing, the British mandate. Because Britain, in fact, as I said, incorporated the Balfour Declaration into this structure. And as a result, did not, in fact, create the kind of institutions that... there There was a parliament in Transjordan, for example, which was split off from the Palestine mandate, so what's now the Kingdom of Jordan, in 1926. Similarly, institutions in in Syria and Iraq, whether we think they were really independent or not, there was some sort of thing going on that wasn't happening here. The first so-called high commissioner, so the ruler of the Palestine mandate or the chief executive, was a guy called Herbert Samuel, Sir Herbert Samuel, a former British cabinet minister. But he was he was also he did believe in Zionism, so he had circulated papers around the cabinet when he was in it and during the war promoting the idea of a Jewish national home and settlement. So he's now in charge of this mandate. The local Palestinian kind of notables, understandably, thought that perhaps this is not entirely neutral kind of uh, situation. And this was confirmed by the first kind of legislative acts or the kind of orders of the mandate, which were to set up... um, something called the Jewish Agency, which kind of an executive institution that basically would be by and for the, the Jewish community, the Yeshuv, which at this time was not that large. So John's mentioned how most, you know, Zionism is minority current amongst European Jews. Predominantly people fleeing their oppression in Europe went to America or other, other Western countries in their millions. Probably about 
80,000, fewer than 100,000 people emigrated to Palestine in the period between 1880 and 1920. Also, the mandate explicitly uh, allowed Jewish immigration or Jewish immigrants to gain Palestinian nationality. So officially, Palestine was a state in waiting. You could have a Palestinian identity document. You can find these. So people like Yitzhak Shamir, um, other Zionist leaders, they were technically, as far as international law was concerned, Palestinians. Giving the Jewish agency or kind of this um, right or principle that Jewish immigrants should be basically uh, acquire this nationality without any uh, just turning up um, meant immigration could increase vastly. And then the third thing was to make it more difficult for Palestinian uh, cultivators, peasants, to um, occupy unoccupied lands, which traditionally they had the right to do under kind of Ottoman land tenure, and instead limit what they could do to encourage the sale of those lands to the Jewish National Fund, which was the part of the kind of Zionist organization that was buying up land. So this provoked a reaction, which was also part of really other uprisings or clashes that were happening across the region in Iraq and in Egypt and Syria as well, where there were a series of riots, basically, or attacks, mass uh, outbursts in, first of all, um, Jerusalem, so Nabi Musa, Prophet Moses, uh, birthday kind of event, where many or several Jews were killed. And then following that year in Jaffa, it was, this is a very strange incident. So it was actually what happened was a group of communists composed of both Jews and Arabs clashed with a group of uh, labor Zionists on the May Day rally. So Zionism was divided at this time now into broadly kind of left or socialist grouping, the Labour Zionists, associated with David Ben-Gurion, and the right-wing part, the Revisionists, associated with a guy called Zev Jabotinsky. So there was a fight between these two groups, not, not Palestinians. The Palestinians didn't know what was going on, thought they were being attacked, and all hell kind of broke loose. With the result, again, that there were... Many Jews were killed and also many Palestinians, many Arabs were then also killed. So this was new, like specifically attacking kind of Jewish businesses or visibly Jewish people, that was new. Even in 1919, 1918, the Palestinian representatives were saying we are explicitly kind of, we are not against kind of our Jewish neighbors and so on. The British mandate actually began in 1923. And during that time, as I've said, the Zionist movement was building up independent institutions. I mentioned the Jewish agency, which basically became the executive of the state, but also military institutions, so militias like the Haganah, the labor Zionist uh, militia, building up its own society with which to replace the existing Palestinian society, which was not unaware of this. So Palestinians were developing their own, their own national movement. There were seven congresses of Palestinian kind of national uh, leaders, which reiterated the same positions that we object to our land being taken away, we want to stop Jewish immigration, we want to have an independent Palestine. Britain just didn't, didn't listen to them, um, just did not recognize them, in fact, although they did recognize the National Assembly of the Yishuv. So this is the fundamental reason that there was this kind of, as well as the economic dispossession going on as a result of the land sales, increasing violence, basically, the violent outburst. So which happened particularly in 1929, which we can see, I mean, there was a specific incident, which was the, the what we, people call Haram al-Sharif, the, the, or, or the, the Temple Mount, Dome of the Rock area in the center of Jerusalem which is holy to both Jews and to Muslims. Jews believe it is the remembrant of the temple, or well, it is, that is where the second temple was. Um, we're setting up kind of permanent installations for prayer, which had been 
rejected previously and had been said, we're not going to do this. And this resulted in these, these riots, or riots, I mean, clashes, uprising to a degree, which did have a kind of intercommunal aspect to them. So both Palestinian Christians and Muslims being killed and Jews. So particularly in Hebron, which is a very old non-Zionist Jewish community, uh, basically left as a result of this. So obviously we can see Hitler comes to power in Germany, but it wasn't just Hitler. I mean, there's a general trend towards the far right in Europe and towards, it should be noted, refusing asylum to the victims of those regimes. So wherever you got, and it wasn't just Germany, it was persecution of the Jews in Austria before the Anschluss, in uh, Romania and other countries. Wherever that happened, the neighboring countries, France, Britain, and also the US, tightened their immigration restrictions. They didn't let more people in, they let fewer people in. As a result, unsurprisingly, many Jews in Europe felt we have nowhere else to go but this one place where at least it's guaranteed where it might be safe. So there was a huge spike in um, emigration in the 1930s on the basis of the mandate allowing it and European regimes creating the need for it, while other European countries denied the right of asylum to those people. So that is really the origin, basically, of the... It's kind of the bedrock of the population that would fight in 1948 to establish the, the state of Israel. But this led to... So we've got this economic dispossession, political exclusion going on of Palestinians. Eventually led to this huge uprising that lasted for three years between 1936 and 1939. It was a national uprising. It was mainly peasants who were fighting, led by the local traditional leadership, including the guy who was actually appointed the chief religious officer, the Mufti of Jerusalem, by the British, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, who, who was genuinely, at this point, certainly anti-Semitic, kind of identified with Hitler and so on. Um, although that's People often present that as if the Arab revolt is therefore a kind of version of Hitlerism, which it's not. It's this kind of desperate uh, uprising by a dispossessed peasant population, which was, it occupied more British troops than the whole of India in this period. This was also when the first Zionist militias really began to learn how to fight. So the Haganah, the Irgun, which was the revisionist uh, militia, and began to crystallize the idea, which already existed, of a so-called transfer. So that there is no, there's no way you can have these two communities in the one space. And in fact, it was Britain, it was British troops that did the most outrageous things. Very familiar colonial tactics, collective punishment, summary execution, blowing up whole villages, um, night raids, so-called, called going and just taking, uh, destroying a place at night. So it was Britain that taught these kind of methods that were eventually to be used, and which of course come from the long, long litany of colonial revolts elsewhere. It's not an accident, perhaps, that the Palestine police force and the kind of paramilitary, colonial paramilitary police force was heavily filled with people who had fought, or officers who had fought in Ireland in the, in the War of Independence, or against the War of Independence. So the Black and Tans, if you are familiar with that, if you were taught about how awful they were by your father, like I was, um, <laughs> uh, they, they, a lot of them ended up in, um, in Palestine. So as a result, two things happened. First of all, the Palestinian kind of community was crushed and had lost its, its sort of leadership, uh, which is very important in 1948. Second, Britain responded to this with uh, a kind of back and forth about how to deal with the situation, because they could see that this is not working. Britain can't continue its occupation. Started off with something called the Peel Commission, which recommended partition, which was eventually what would happen in 1948, a Jewish state and an Arab state. Even though the Arab Palestinians were the vast majority, that there'd be a Jewish state that would occupy an area that would have an Arab minority almost as large as the Jewish population in it. This made the revolt worse. So then Britain kind of went back 
on this uh, idea with the so-called white paper of 1949, slip of the tongue, 39, which envisaged an independent Palestine with restricted Jewish immigration. So that it would be restricted, I think, to 75,000 people over 10 years, which, of course, alienated the, the Zionists, who then took up their own campaign, partly against British rule, but also against Arab communities. So per the Irgun, particularly the revisionist Zionists, uh, were, were kind of attacking Arab uh, Palestinian markets and, and things like that. Were there any distinctions between the European Jews that came and the non-European Jews in terms of their support slash zeal for the Zionist movement? Well, that's a very understudied topic. So there have been some suggestions recently of perhaps some penetration of Zionist ideas in Morocco um, and Algeria, but it's not clear. It's, you know, they might be a few thinkers. In terms of the, the Yemenis, so they were definitely brought on religious terms. It was through the kind of rabbis, through the kind of religious outreach. But as, as John was saying, Zionism was not primarily a religious movement, not even fundamentally a religious movement. And even in Europe, most of the religious establishment, Jewish religious establishment, opposed Zionism. And you'll see to this day, there are some very small, but small groups of ultra-Orthodox Jews who are very anti-Zionist because they identify this nationalism as a worship of the state. And they say, we worship God, we don't worship the state. Um, and so they think it consider it blasphemous. So there wasn't a great movement of Zionism in these areas. To the where you find a lot of involvement of Arab Jews in politics tends to be on the left. So particularly in Egypt and Iraq, the communist parties very much, and Morocco as well actually, very many Jews were in them. Within the Jewish community though, I should have mentioned, there was a fundamental system of racist discrimination between Palestinians and Jewish settlers. In the civil service, Palestinians got paid half what Jews got paid. And as a result, or through a whole of the labor market, Palestinians were paid less, and there was a concerted attempt to remove them from the economy. This was why the Histradut, the trade union, was established, from which Arabs were excluded. Couldn't join it until 1959. The whole point was to create what they called J Jewish labor. So exclude, which is quite, if you want to do this, that's what you should do. You know, you establish kind of the, the production is what is the key. Um, but even within the Jewish community, so there's a big, there are big difference between the so-called Mitzrachim or the Oriental Jews, Middle Eastern Jews, uh, and the Europeans, the Ashkenazim. The Mitzrachim were looked down upon within, even within this community. And there's some evidence that maybe they were subject to these wage differentials as well. They were discriminated against as well. And if you read the, if you look at the memoirs of some of the Zionist leaders, they're very disparaging about these groups. And they say these were lower quality kind of settlers, lower quality fighters, or this, this kind of thing, which persisted. Um, after the state of Israel was founded, but we're not we're not going on to that. But it persisted, and it's part of the same. I mean, it's part of the same idea. If the whole point is Arabs are blighting this land, what if you turn up and there's a bunch of people you thought were Jewish, but actually talk Arabic? They eat Arab food. They have Arab families. They dance to Arab music. They are, to all intents and purposes, Arabs. You're gonna have the same ideas about them. And I, and I guess that really underscores why it, it wasn't like a specifically religious no movement. No, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Could you also talk us through uh, the specifics of the first proposed solution uh, in the Appeal Commission and what exactly the plans were? Yeah, so the plan was that there would be two states. I mean, it's kind of, ex there's not much more to say on it than that. That there would be a, kind of the northern part, which is now around Haifa, Jaffa, Tiberias, which is kind of more fertile area where most of the Jewish settlement was, that that would be the Jewish state. And within that, there would be a Jewish majority, but it wasn't 
a very large majority. There would still be Arabs in the Jewish state. And then this kind of bo bottom part going down into the desert, into the Negev, would be Palestinian state, Arab state, which would have most of the Arabs or the Arab Palestinians in it, most of the Palestinians in it, with some small amount of Jewish communities. In the middle, there would be a kind of band of neutral zone around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, holy places. I can't. I don't think Hebron is included in this. Although Hebron is very no, uh, for Hebron is very sacred to both Jews and Muslims, actually, as the site of purported site of the tomb of of Abraham. So the holy place would be a separate area. So that was the that was the commission plan. That was the commission plan. What was the um, the exact percentages of which land was going to go to the Arabs and which land was going to go to? Not exactly for the Peel Commission, but I can tell you for the partition plan, which is basically the same idea. So it's what came out in 1948, the UN partition plan. It would be a 56% of the land would have been the Jewish state and it would have had half a million Jews in it and 492,000 Arabs in it. So in a population of about roughly a million, basically equal. But one side of that population, which had arrived recently from Europe, would have a kind of supremacy in that state, which was the majority of the land. And then in the remainder, you have this neutral bit around Bethlehem and Jerusalem, which again, to the Palestinians was kind of an outrage. Because it was, What's up to you, what you do with Jerusalem? We're not telling you what to do with London. 42% would be the Arab state with about 800,000 Arab Palestinians in it and 10,000 Jews. So much, much smaller ratio. There would be a really tiny minority. So I don't think these were that, this was what the, the partition plan, but that was based upon the ideas of the Peel Commission. So you're saying the Peel Commission was something similar to this? Similar. But that was revoked by Britain in 1939 with the White Paper. So the White Paper said, we're not going to do this. We're going to have an independent state of Palestine in 10 years with a basically kind of bi binational rule with limited Jewish immigration. So it will limit Jewish immigration to 75,000 people and therefore there won't be a greater, uh, there won't be a Jewish majority. And that was, that was 75,000 people over the next five years? I think it was 15,000 a year for five years. Yeah. Total of 75,000. And, and that was from 1939 to 1944? Yes. But obviously something intervened, which was the Second World War and the Holocaust, mm. which and changed everything. How did it change it? I mean, how did it change the, the immigration toward Palestine? Because it was clear that Jews needed somewhere to go. So people, not un, you know, understandably, felt these people have been murdered and now they are seeking refuge. Again... It wasn't the case that Britain, for example, took in all of these, or was willing to take in all of these refugees. But it wasn't something Britain was forcing to happen. There was a huge wave, or there were large numbers of people just turning up in boats uh, after the Second World War, getting off the boats and, you know, becoming citizens or just taking up land. Um, 1942, the Biltmore Programme, that's when um, this Congress in America instituted a programme to establish what was called a Jewish Commonwealth in Palestine, aka set up a Jewish state that would be a state for Jews. Um, Palestinians could live there, but it would be on the understanding they would be a very much a minority and would be controlled by Jews. You then have 1947, when Britain refers the issue of Palestine back to the UN. Now, Jamie was talking about uh, how the, the Zionist militias, the Haganah, but also, um, and the Irgun and so on, began to take action, depending on where you're coming from, it's it can be called terrorism or it can be called resistance, the idea being that they were trying to get the British to leave. Of course, by getting the British to leave, because Britain had not provided any form of self-determination of the Palestinian people, as I said earlier on, there was no parliament, there was no um, 
you know, there was no, the only government there was the Arab, was the British um, administration. And of course, the Zionist movement had its own internal state within a state. So that would have left the Palestinian people, the Arab people of Palestine, completely powerless. So what then happened was in 1947, uh, the strain became too much for Britain to bear. Remember, Britain was bankrupt in the aftermath of World War II. And Britain just referred the issue back to the United Nations, saying, you decide what to do. Um, that led to a resolution to partition Palestine. Now, this was a General Assembly resolution. And it is often said, you often hear the narrative, um, the UN agreed to partition Palestine. The Jewish side, the Zionist movement accepted it. The Arabs rejected it. The Arabs did the wrong thing. They then fought against the um, establishment of the State of Israel, and they lost the war. Tough luck. But uh, that, uh, that is not actually the way it is seen by international lawyers. And what happened after um, Britain withdrew, Britain said in 1947, right, we're going to leave Palestine by the 15th of May next year, the 15th of May 1948, we will be out. At that point, basically, Britain abandoned Palestine. The UN partition plan was not legally binding. There was, it was a very provisional plan as well. Um, if you read it, and it's worth looking up online, you can find it very easily, you will see it is not something that you, that you just decree. Um, it, it involved a, a huge framework to put it into effect. There would be a commission established to define boundaries, and all sorts of things, and none of that happened. So the Palestine partition plan was basically always a dead duck. But the Arab side, immediately it was announced, began kind of, you know, their own bits of guerrilla warfare. Much of it was what one would indisputably call terrorism. Um, but what they were doing was they were fighting to have this reversed because they did not want uh, their land taken away from themselves. What the Zionist side did, it had been preparing for years now for the moment when the British would withdraw and they would set up their state. And they began to implement that. And the difficulty with doing that was, if I can go back for the umpteenth time, the fact that the Palestinian Arabs had no institutions. So if there was lawlessness, you can't really be surprised. The law was enforced by the British police, by the British army, and these were now withdrawing or being disbanded. And the, but the only way that um, Israel could come into existence as a state was by declaring its independence. And before that, in preparation for that, it had to secure the country that would become its own state. And that basically meant we're going to take over control of Palestine by force of arms. Now, in international law, that is what is called secession. And it means armed when a state successfully comes into existence through a, rebe through a rebellion against the lawful sovereign. So, you so what basically was happening was that the Zionist movement was doing this in Palestine in the late, in late 1947, particularly in the spring of 1948. As the deadline for the British departure grew closer, they began to make sure they could take over as much of the countryside as they could, particularly strategic locations um, in con to control the major road arteries in the country, for instance. And that inevitably meant the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, because the only way this could be effectively do could be done effectively was by emptying many villages, emptying many towns, some cities. Um, if you look at a map of the proposed partition plan, by the way, 
it never in, you can see it never envisaged either state being completely separate from the other. A principal Arab port was Jaffa. Jaffa was a wholly Arab or virtually wholly Arab town, but it would be a little enclave surrounded by territory that would go to the Jewish side. And Af Jaffa, for instance, was um, taken and ethnically cleansed by the Jewish militias while Britain was still nominally in control of Palestine. This incidentally led to a great deal of bitterness against Britain in the Middle East, which led on to other things like the Suez Crisis to an extent, but also the 1958 revolution in Iraq when um, the pro-British monarchy was overthrown. On the final day of the mandate, the British government had to ask its lawyers, how are we going to, um, you know, what's our legal position? What happens to Palestine now? Please put all this into a telegram and send it to uh, the British uh, mission to the United Nations so that our ambassador there can know the situation and he can defend the British position. And this is one of the things that was said in that legal advice. And I'm going to read it twice. It's not def terribly difficult to understand, but it's very important. And legal things need to be explained clearly. If the Jews claim to set up a state in the boundaries of the Jewish areas as defined by the United Nations Partition Plan, and the Arabs claim to set up a state covering the whole of Palestine, there would be nothing legally to choose between those claims. Second time, if the Jews claim to set up a state in the boundaries of the Jewish areas as defined by the United Nations Partition Plan, and the Arabs claim to set up a state covering the whole of Palestine, there would be nothing legally to choose between these claims. So that shows you that the partition plan was not legally binding. And what Britain did was abandon Palestine to chaos and war. Very uh, quickly uh, about, so a common belief about the foundation of the State of Israel is that it was founded on the 15th of May and the very next day, in fact, the same day, it was attacked by uh, several surrounding Arab states, which is true, that, that did happen. But actually, the, as John said, there was already a conflict going on, and it was one in which the Nakba, the cleansing of the Palestinians, was already happening. So it's a mistake to believe that the Nakba happened because of the war. The war happened because of the Nakba. And that's clear in Israeli documents, particularly those relating to something called Plan Dalit, which Dalit is the Hebrew... D. So there was Plan Aleph, Bet, and so on, ABC, and then eventually settled upon Plan Dalit, which was approved by David Ben Gurion on the 10th of March. The 10th of March, two months before foundation of the State of Israel, 10th of March 1948. And it consisted of this order to the Haganah, to the commanders of the army. The operations can be carried out in the following manner either by destroying villages, by setting fire to them, by blowing them up by planting mines in the rubble, and especially, as John mentioned, those population centres that are difficult to control permanently. In case of resistance, the armed forces must be wiped out and the population expelled outside the borders of the state. That is in the IDF archives. It's the 10th of March, 1948. On the 9th of April, of course, we've probably heard of the massacre at Deir Yassin, where an entire village were killed. It's not, there were hundreds hundreds of these, which were happening already at this time. Particularly, it's been mentioned Jaffa, because Jaffa and Haifa were big Palestinian commercial centres where there was a leadership kind of elite. In Jaffa, there were 30, 30 families were left out of the entire population. If you go to Jaffa now, you can walk through this. It's quite offensive, actually. You walk through the streets of this kind of Disneyland version of an Arab souk. And the people who live there are not allowed to return to the houses that have been airbrushed and changed into this like tourist attraction. 
similar thing happened in Haifa. So there's been a lot of Israeli commentators and politicians call up the, the image, the idea that one day, if too much concessions are given to Hamas or whoever, they'll throw the Jews into the sea, they'll drive them into the sea. And that would be a horrific atrocity. You know, that would be a genocide. That would be ethnic cleansing. That already happened to the people of Haifa. In April, before, so a month before the, dec the declaration of the State of Israel, the so-called the Carmel Brigade of the Haganah were given the job of attacking the Arab quarters of Haifa so that people would leave. And in fact, again, these are in the archives. The, the, br the brigadier, Mordechai Maclef, gave the order, kill any Arab you encounter. So that is in the archives. As a result, 15,000 people left, scattered to the winds, to Gaza, to other refugee camps, and others went to the port of Gaza where they were shelled. Haifa, sorry, port of Haifa, where they were shelled and fired upon until they ran into the sea. They were driven into the sea where they tried to get in fishing boats. Some of them drowned, some of them made it to Lebanon. It already happened to these people. 